Okay, so our second talk is another research coordination network funded through EarthCube that one of the three that started in 2013 in addition to C4P, Cyber Infrastructure for Paleo Geoscience, and EC3, which Maddie just talked about. So this one is called SEN, Building a Sediment Experimentalist Network. And before I start, I really just want to acknowledge um, all the other PIs, the postdocs, the people who have helped us develop some of our tools, and, you know, a lot of people are really volunteering their time to help this project get off the ground. So I want to start by just presenting the motivation for why this RCN needs to exist. And then I'll get into a summary of the activities and finally discuss how SEN fits in with the rest of EarthCube. Uh, but first of all, I just like showing this slide, which has a bunch of different examples of the sediment experiment to, uh, experiments that we are talking about. So these are sort of meter scale lab representations of Earth surface processes, which happen on deltas, floodplains, river channels, and they're studying sediment transport and deposition. And there's a lot of implications for this work in interpreting the past rock record and mitigating natural hazards. And as you can see from these examples, um, these are quite unique experiments. A lot of times they're developed by a grad student and an advisor sitting down and deciding how to design the experiment to answer their scientific question. So the next thing is that expectations about research data are evolving pretty quickly these days. And we'll do a little bit of data stratigraphy here since some of SEN is trained in stratigraphy. This is a great example from one of our members, Yoris. Um, he's showing here on his shelf the way that he has backed up his data. Even in the past five years, you can see that you know, 2009, most of the time the data was backed up on CDs or DVDs. Uh, the next year in 2010, you have these pretty big external drives that would offer a lot of backup space, but they're still pretty big and bulky. Then a couple years later, the drives are getting smaller and um, they have a higher volume of storage. But you still have a lot of this physical drives that you're, you need to put somewhere on the shelf. But then after 2013, maybe some of the backup is even in the cloud and you don't even have something physical that's there. So some of the things that are changing pretty quickly now, uh, there's newer technologies, high resolution video, that's creating a very large volume of data that the experimentalists need to deal with. Uh, as most of the people involved in the EarthCube projects know, funding agencies are now asking for data management plans. Journals want to link to the full archive data sets, not just some representative um, subset of it. And these days, there's better attribution enabled by new metrics for data citation. So all of these things are changing pretty quickly. And then just to wrap up the motivations here, the grand challenges in experimental geomorphology and earth surface processes really require data syntheses and not just single experiments. So some of the main challenges that we've identified in SEN are reproducibility of experiments. If you set everything up exactly the same two times, are you going to get the same result in your experiment? Another one is autogenic versus allogenic processes. So to what extent are environmental forcings causing the resultant um, delta or channel as opposed to some sort of internal dynamics? And then another grand challenge is scaling of these meter scale experiments up to the real scale. So here's just an example of three um, experiments on the top row of a debris flow deposit 
a channel and a delta, and we're working at the meter scale, but how can we best translate these results to the actual scale on the Earth's surface? And these problems have been worked on, but really using the full range of experimental results and synthesizing them will get us a lot further towards answering these challenges. So for these reasons, that's why we propose to have SEND, the Sediment Experimentalist Network, in order to integrate the efforts of the experimentalists and build a knowledge base for guidance and best practices for data collection and management and also to be the liaison to cyber infrastructure and geoinformatics communities. So in the figure, um, each of those squares sort of represents either a single experimentalist or a laboratory, and these are all connected to the SEND network. And later in the talk, I'll be discussing the three components of it. And through SEN activities, we are trying to get to coordinated data to address the grand challenges, broad collaborations, talking about data and metadata standards, which our community hardly has talked about in the past, uh, finding educational tools, and ultimately leading to more efficient science data publications. And we also want to make sure we're not ignoring existing efforts that are already there that we can learn from. So what SEN is trying to do is to support researchers throughout the data life cycle. And if you look at this figure on the right-hand side, the data life cycle is sort of represented in the inner circle. And um, this may be familiar to you where you you start the project and you're planning and designing the data collection and then you move through the different sections and then release and publish the data and somebody else can discover and reuse the data. Well, there's also an experimental life cycle that parallels this data life cycle. And the SEM activities are trying to help the experimentalists at each step and also, importantly, try to really increase this last part of the cycle here, the dark parts of discovery and renewing the cycle, actually reusing some of the products of these experimental experiments. So there are three main components of SEN. Um, the first is education and data standards. So we're trying to facilitate community discussion of data practices and standards, what exists and what does the community want. We're also trying to disseminate guidelines as much as we can and provide training about data management and sharing. The second component is the knowledge base. So there we're trying to develop online resources for experimental data management, provide a wiki where people can go to post and find data and methods, and also actively recruit data sets for inclusion in online repositories. Because as you probably all know, it's recruitment is sort of necessary when these things are getting started. Unfortunately, people aren't just uh, running at us with their data sets at first. And then the third component is the experimental collaboratories where we're facilitating collaboration between different laboratories, um, developing infrastructure such as webcams to share experiments in real time, and also working with broadcasting experiments and planning distributed experiments. So now I'm just going to go through some of the activities that we've done and, and what is the purpose of these activities. So we've been holding town halls to facilitate community discussion at each of the three previous AGUs. And this is really just to provide a place where anyone can come and voice their needs for, for better data sharing and reusing. And for each of these town halls, we make sure to write up some sort of a summary or report so these can be used either by other EarthCube members or by our own community if they want to cite a certain document, say, in a proposal or something. 
We also have workshops. The purpose of these is really to learn and experiment together. Uh, we were one of the end user workshops that was funded by EarthCube in 2012. Uh, we also had some workshops in Japan and in the Netherlands in 2013 and 2014. So at these workshops, we have keynote talks to um, discuss some of the recent science findings, but also it's really important that we have dedicated discussions about data management and new technologies and also these community experiments where the whole workshop sort of helps to set up the experiments and watches the experiment run from beginning to end. And in that way, we're creating a lot of shared experiences and sort of giving tips to each other as we see like some methods that we might use in our lab or in a different lab. So another component of the education and standards is to uh, go out to these summer institutes where there's early career researchers and sort of talk to them about some of the SEN activities and also data management. So there is a summer institute that has been held at NSED, the National Center for Earth Surface Dynamics. This is held at St. Anthony Falls Laboratory at University of Minnesota, and they have a very rich history of using experiments to get at these scientific questions. And they usually have a lab component, which you can see here. So even though all of the attendees are not necessarily experimentalists, they get some hands-on experience of actually you know, setting up the experiments and making the measurements. So while we're there, we like to also give lectures about what are the latest SEN activities and get some feedback from them as well. And it's always great to talk with the early career researchers who seem to, in general, be a little bit more enthusiastic about the sharing and reuse of data. And finally, another component of the education and standards is we have a proposed metadata profile for experiments. Um, this is a, a guideline that we're suggesting and we're getting community feedback on it. But I think it's been really useful for SEN to have been part of EarthCube and to learn a lot about what other groups have been doing so we can suggest something that's not completely reinventing the wheel. Uh, what we've done is recommend some basic information that's following data site guidelines for describing data sets, but also we're trying to come up with discipline-specific information, which is the type of information that would be really important for reusing the data. Okay, so now some of the things that we've developed in the knowledge base component of SEN. Uh, in our first year and a half, we've been working really hard to get the SEN wiki up and populating it with data and methods descriptions. So we feel this is one of the centerpieces where uh, a request of many community members is they didn't know where to go to really find information specifically on experimental geomorphology. So by creating this wiki, we are putting links to data sets, but also descriptions of methods, how to set up experiments, how to, and also different types of equipment. So this is where Charles Nguyen at the University of Minnesota and his team has been really helpful. Um, we always have a lot of requests for his team and he quickly uh, makes these updates. And we're trying not to build anything like a very cyber infrastructure heavy system, but really just something simple where we can start collecting all of these resources um, in a way that makes sense to our community and um, is full of things specifically from our community so it'll be more useful. Some other things that we're trying to do is just gather this 
combined knowledge that people have once they do the experiments. So one thing we've tried to do is gather this list of where do people get sediment for their experiments. And once you do it the first time, you sort of know where to go later. But for a lot of beginning graduate students or people just starting with experiments, they really don't know where to go at first. So this is just a simple list where we're gathering vendor names of places where people have bought sediment. And now moving on to the collaboratory component. Um, these are the community experiments, which uh, I mentioned during the workshops. They're really to create shared experiences and data sets that are open to the public and anyone can use and either use it for their own research or use it for teaching purposes. So the pictures here are from the community experiment that was at the 2014 Utrecht workshop. And what you're seeing in some of the pictures is a deposit of a delta. It's all at the, the basin has already been drained. So when this was formed, it was mostly underwater. But this is the process afterwards when the basin is drained and now we're trying to characterize the topography and cut into it and look at the stratigraphy. And it's really a great experience for those who don't get the chance to do it themselves because they either work in some other type of experiment or even for the cyber infrastructure people who we invite to come to our workshops. So they get an idea of exactly the workflow of collecting this type of data. So I also mentioned broadcasting the experiments and distributed experiments. And this is where our postdoc, Kim Miller, has been really active lately and she's really taking this project on. The broadcast experiments are now more possible because of IP cameras or even on YouTube Live. There's the technology where you can broadcast the experiment while it's happening. And this creates a sense of community and also allows discussion and questions in real time, which is something that we've experienced during our workshops. The distributed experiments are experiments that are planned to be coordinated across different labs. So these are ones that we're planning to address grand challenges that we've identified. And by either repetition or slight changes in the different locations where the experiments are done, we can gather a data set that is more aligned and better for use. And this picture here is just Kim, she's tweeting when she's doing her live broadcast of experiments, which is something really cool. You can just follow along as the image updates. So now we're getting to the point of we do all this stuff, how are we actually spreading this to the community? And that's where our outreach in newsletters, blog, and social media really helps to inform those um, within our community and even the wider community. So we have monthly newsletters where we try to summarize some of the recent activities. And we have a blog that archives these newsletters and also um, points to other announcements. And one thing that's pretty surprising is, well, at least to me, is through Twitter, that's really one way to reach those that I think would have been hard to reach otherwise, just within the traditional, uh, maybe NSF geomorphology community. Especially, Kim is especially good at this. If you put some hashtags on that are really good keywords, that's a great way to reach others that are just interested in geology in general. So actually a large number of views of our newsletters comes through Twitter. Okay, so to try to summarize these activities that I've been talking on and on about, which I would like to sort of fit it into this framework where we're really trying to listen to the needs of the SEND community 
through the town halls and workshops, for example, gather the information that they're giving to us and through the wiki or through shared resources. And then finally, sharing these with the wider community through social media or reports and papers. So I just want to end with some of the ways that SEN is coordinating with other EarthCube projects right now. And hopefully um, as a result of this talk, we will be able to find some more partnerships or leveraging. One of the projects that we're working with is Geosoft, which is coming from the perspective of enabling better practices with scientific software. So through our partnership with them, we're able to learn about and encourage best practices for software within our community. Uh, there's the TurboSoft portal, which Geosoft has created, which we are testing to try to better document our scripts, the many scripts that go into analyzing and visualizing the experimental data. And another thing that's been fun to do is Geosoft recommended that we start a GitHub repository. And even though some of the members of our community are uh, familiar with this, a lot of us are not. So this is a great learning experience for us to try to, to get better practices with our scripts. We're also working with the Synergy Building Block, which is building a catalog of EarthCube resources. So Synergy is working to build community resource viewers. And this screenshot just shows a number of different resources that were identified by the SEND community. A resource can be many different things, a data set, a web page, a journal, a Twitter feed, and just trying to get these all in one place and visualizing them in different ways is one way of discovering new resources. And then finally, we have a, a project with the Geosemantic Framework Building Block. Uh, I think the full name is the Geosemantic Framework for Long Tail Data and Models. And this is leading to better documented data sets and connections to models. So this is something that you know, we really want to, we've always had the goal of better documenting our data sets and using some of the technologies that are out there, such as the Seed Active Content Repository. And we also have a lot of colleagues or even experimentalists themselves have contributed to the system's Community Surface Dynamics modeling system. But in the SEN Research Coordination Network itself, there's not really, it's not in scope to really go further in depth and work on making sure the data sets have the appropriate metadata and annotations, and how is this link to the model actually made? And this is something we're working on in this partnership. Okay, so now, what are some of the things that would define success for SEN? I think three things that we can identify are, we want SEN information to be easily discoverable and accessible. It would be great if we asked the Earth Surface Process community, do you know where to go to find information and resources on sediment experimentalists and their experiments? And their answer becomes yes, as opposed to no, I'm not really sure because there's a lot of different places and it's mostly just in the published papers. So making information more discoverable and accessible is goal number one. Another goal is that SEN and cyber infrastructure would know each other's capabilities and needs. And this is really where EarthCube comes in. So we'd like to increase the domain scientist knowledge of what cyber infrastructure resources are out there and also let CI investigators know what are, you know, what are the use cases and what are the needs of the SEN community. And then third, it would, I think it would be a huge success if SEN is really starts this culture change for sharing and documenting data. So if we could say 
you know, at the end of SEN or in the future of SEN, new experiments will expect to share information about their experiments during as well as after their experiments are done. That would be a huge success. And all of these three things would ultimately lead to more efficient research and progress towards the grand challenges. Of course, there are some challenges that we have to reaching these goals, and I think some of the ones that we've experienced are making sure we reach our audience and achieve a critical mass for sharing, especially at first. Long-term storage of very large volume data sets. We have experiments with high-resolution video that run about four terabytes per experiment, and these researchers are are still really looking for a, a good place that will take and archive their data. Another challenge is coming to a consensus and agreeing on shared formats. This includes um, looking at both resources that already exist as opposed to wanting to build our own. So agreeing on what to use and trying to use existing things that already exist, that's a challenge. The fourth one is simply making time for SEN activities in the research workflow because many of these activities are new and we feel that they're really going to improve the efficiency of um, the science. However, there is a time commitment that's needed. And finally, the sustainability of SEN activities after the initial project period, which I think is something that many of the current EarthCube projects are thinking about. So I just want to end there and say that we are always open to hearing from anyone, either an experimentalist or somebody outside of our community to sort of discuss any of these issues that I've talked about. And also a big thanks to those that are on our steering committee and those that have been helping us uh, on, our, on our journey so far. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the WebEx to see if there's any questions. Okay, so there is one comment that uh, I feel like the challenges you list are fundamental to many slash most of the science funded projects, even if the experimental tools are different. And I agree. I think when I was coming up with the challenges list, I thought that, you know, I tried to make it sort of relevant to more, or actually I wasn't trying to make it relevant to more more projects, but I think in the end, these really are very general and common challenges for a lot of the EarthCube projects. Uh, I think that another question that I would have since there are several RCN participants here is just how the RCNs could help each other even if the quest, the communities we're addressing are different. Um, if we could share ideas that we have on outreach and, and achieving critical mass, that would be really helpful. Okay, one of the questions is, will these presentations be made available? Because you want to get some more of the details. So yes, all of the C4P webinars are recorded and archived on the YouTube site. And I'll also try to ask um, for the slides to be made available. Sometimes that is more useful as well. And the talks are usually posted uh, a few days after the webinar.
Okay, so we have a comment here where we have a member of the EarthCube engagement team and they would really like to see more participation from the RCNs. So I'll be sure to pass that message along both to C4P and all the other RCNs. Okay, so we've reached the end of the hour here. I'd just like to thank everyone for their participation and remind you that um, the webinar schedule is available on the C4P webpage. We will be having a lot of presentations from the different EarthCube projects. So I think it'll be a great opportunity to learn what others are doing and how efforts can be leveraged. So I'd just like to say thanks for joining and hope to see you at a future C4P webinar.